making people fall asleep. So okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so just let me share my screen. Is it visible to all? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for this nice introduction. And I also thank the organizers for this nice uh, invitation. And I would really like to uh, like the share my work with all of you. And I have made my presentation keeping in mind that the large part of the audience is the students. So time to time, I can also, I mean, you can also ask me the questions and I can also ask the questions. So it should be going the both ways. Okay, so uh, the title of the talk was like the journey of the humble nucleus. And uh, then I actually tweaked it a little bit like the journey of the humble nucleus towards exoticity. So as you can see that by riding a spaceships in the Star Wars, people are trying to uh, explore the unknown territory. So we, the nuclear physicists also do in this way. And there is another reason why I put this piece, uh, like the starship uh, in the background, like the Star Wars in the background. So you know this guy, uh, like the very famous guy who is very obsessed with physics and Star Wars. And it is not a kind of the fiction anymore because in GSI Germany, when we have the open day, there were a lot of people visited to see the experimental facility. And you can see that how the, like the normal people were really excited to see a huge neutron detector, which is at the back. And people were thinking they are associated with the Star Wars, so they are just posing it in there like the outfit. So it was uh, open, uh, I mean, the, like it, uh, it is called the Das Universum in labor means you are creating the universe in the laboratory. And this is called the Tag der Tour, Offnen, uh, Tag der Offnen Tour, which is the open day. And it was on 7th May in 2017. Okay, so back to the real thing. Uh, so these are the different scales in physics that uh, like if you look into the galaxy or like the universe, so the dimensions of the order of 10 to the power 26 meter. So when you come to the sun, it is 10 to the power 11. When you go to the earth, it is 10 to the power seven. We, the humans are roughly average around one meter. Then we have the red blood cell, which is 10 to the power minus five meter. Then the radius of the atom is of the order of angstrom. And then this is the radius of the atomic nucleus, which is of the order of femtium, uh, like the femtometer, like 10 to the minus 14 or 10 to the power minus 15. So as just I said that thus universum in labor, it means that using this, uh, you are uh, looking into this tiny object into the laboratory and using this tiny object, you are trying to mapping this whole universe and you want to uh, explore the unknown territory. So this is our goal, like you can simulate the universe in the laboratory and we can do a lot of exciting things. Okay, so now uh, if I ask you that how do you identify different elements, so people will jump into this periodic table of elements and these are different elements as you can see. And uh, just I want to mention one point that these elements are called the super heavy elements and uh, in this case, like this DS, it is called the dumpster DM because this element has been discovered in GSI Germany. And uh, this has been named as the dumpster DM. It has an atomic number of 110 and it uh, becomes into this IUPSE nomenclature. So in the similar way, 113 was discovered in Japan and the Japan in like the Japan in the Japanese language is called an Nihon, and in this element is called the Nihonium or something like that. So this is uh, like, this is the periodic table. This is the modern periodic table. But like the, as a nuclear physicist, we want to do something more. So what we came up with that we want to discover in this way. So we put the proton number in the Y axis and the neutron number in the X axis and uh, this, and then we put all the elements in this simple chart. 
And here, these black points are the stable elements that we see in our real life. And this pink or the blue one are the exotic nucleus, which has a very exotic uh, neutron to proton ratios, and they are unstable. OK? So uh, now, if you just zoom here, so just for your, uh, for your understanding, if you zoom into this little, uh, like in this region, what you will see that this is all the different elements up to oxygen. So I just zoomed up to oxygen from hydrogen to oxygen here. And again, these black points are the stable elements. So, and this pink and this blue one are the unstable. So just to give you an idea that if we concentrate on the carbon, let's say, so what are the stable elements of carbon? We have 12 carbon and 13 carbon, and sometimes we can also deal with the 14 carbon. So this 14 carbon is mainly responsible for the, uh, like the radiocarbon dating, but nevertheless, we have like these three mixtures of the carbon in the, like on Earth. But when I am talking about exotic nucleus, it means that I am talking about 22 carbon. So you can imagine that you can keep on increasing the neutron number, and this 22 carbon uh, has a very distinctive feature, and it has completely different characteristics as the, like the normal carbon. But what are the different characteristics? I will tell you later. But this is the way, like how exotic you can go. And for example, if you talk about the oxygen, the, the, I mean, you can go until 24 oxygen, something like this around here. Okay, so again, uh, uh, then in this chart, like if you go along the x-axis, you will create the isotopes. If you go along the y-axis, you will create the isotones. So what are the isotones? It has the same number of neutrons and it has the same number of proton. And if you go in this diagonally, you will create an isobar. It means that the summation of neutron and proton are the same, or in other words, the mass number is the same if you go in this diagonal way. So by looking into this picture, you can identify all the isotone, isotope, or isobar. So now you can ask me a question. Okay, Mr. Bakchi, you have uh, told that like these are the things, so I can arrange in terms of the Lego, and then, okay, so, uh, so let us do it. So in, uh, in case of the Riken Accelerator Facility in Tokyo, Japan, so people have uh, like built this Lego, and then uh, this uh, z-axis here, they are the relative abundances that we have, uh, uh, that we see on Earth. So the hydrogen has the most abundant nuclei, and then it, this abundance actually decreases as you go on for the other cases. Okay, so until this it is fine, but then the nuclear physicists got even bored, so they have arranged all the nucleus, but then what else? So they want to do something more. So what they did, so they, they actually created a th third dimension. So what is the third dimension? This third dimension is basically the strangeness number. So again, you have this Z and N, and this number is the strangeness number, and probably you all know that this strangeness number is nothing but it comes from the strange quark in the, like, uh, in the standard model. So if a nucleus consists of these strange quarks, it is called the hyperons. So the hyperons are like lying on the different, uh, like the z-axis, as you can see, but for the, uh, I mean, and here the strangeness number zero means all the other elements that we see, and it has no strange quarks. So for the rest of our discussion, we will only continue with s equals to zero, or there is no strangeness number, for example. So we will only continue in this way. Okay, so we have now arranged all the nucleus. Yeah, so this is the proton number, this is the neutron number, and we have arranged all the nucleus here. And uh, this is basically the n equals to z line. Okay, so here, the, like the number of neutrons and number of protons are equal. But as you can see that if you keep on increasing, uh, or if you keep on going towards the heavy nucleus, 
it actually bends on this side. It means that it is accommodating more neutron than proton. So can anyone tell why this is so? What is the reason why it is bending? Don't be shy. So it is due to the Coulomb term. So due to the Coulomb, in order to uh, like neutralize the Coulomb repulsion, so we need to accommodate more neutrons. So therefore, this n equals to z line is actually merging here. So something like it starts from here, it goes there, but all the other nucleus uh, like uh, try to bend in order to accommodate the Coulomb repulsion, and we have more neutrons. Okay, so the thing is that we have, uh, like, we have arranged all the nucleus, fine. And this line, these dashed lines are the theoretical estimates. As you can see that, and these points are the, uh, are the experimental observation. So as you can see that uh, for until um, around calcium or something, the theory predicts that we can also have more number of nucleus, but it is not been experimentally observed. So we have to try to figure it out what is happening. So this, uh, this void, we need to uh, like uh, fill in, for example. So this is the theory and all the other points are the experiments. So this is one reason that we have to keep on discovering the nucleus, uh, like different, uh, like the nucleus as we keep on increasing the neutron number. But what happens if I am shifting very much from this black point? So let's say I am, I am putting myself here around this point, what is happening? So there are a lot of interesting phenomena are occurring. So some of them are called that like the pygmy resonance or soft dipole modes, I will come to these points. And then for example, we know that the established magic numbers, what are those like, for example, two, eight, 20, then 50, something like that. So if you keep on increasing the neutron number, then this established magic number will be disappearing and some new magic number are appearing. So I will come to that point. And we also have a neutron scheme. I will also say that in the later slides. And also we have some like the giant resonances, peak resonances, soft dipole modes, and all the things are very interesting when you want to go like, uh, I mean, uh, when you want to study this phenomena towards very exotic nuclei, which has a large amount of the neutrons. One interesting phenomena is that, uh, so it is a nucleon halo. So what is that? So for example, if you are confining yourself in these black points, what, or it is called the stable elements. So you can see that the density distribution of the neutrons and protons are roughly equal. But when you go somewhere here, let's say, it has a large amount of the neutrons and which can produce a skin. So it is called the neutron skin. And when you are uh, going towards the uh, very right hand side in this region, there is a fairly good chance that you will be creating a halo nucleus. As you can see that these nucleons are quite separated from the rest of the core. So this is basically 11 lithium. So 11 lithium has three protons and eight neutrons. Among these eight neutrons, like the six neutrons are lying exactly close to the protons, but the two neutrons are quite separated. And this feature is called the uh, nuclear halo or the new, uh, I mean the nucleon halo. And uh, if these are the valence neutron, then it's called the neutron halo. And when you see the density distribution, this density distribution is quite far, like quite extended, as you can see. So this is a very interesting feature, which is uh, quite missing in case of the stable elements. Okay, 
So now uh, I go one by one. Uh, so first, let me show you the nucleosynthesis process. So as you all know that in case of the sun, we have like the hydrogen burning. So the two hydrogen are got fused and by different processes, it comes to the helium. So this, is, this whole process is the, is the hydrogen burning. And then when all the hydrogen will be finished, then helium burning will start and so on and so forth. And also in some other stars, we have the CNO cycle, for example, where the nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen are taken into part. And of course, you have some extra like the neutrino or like, uh, yeah, so some gamma rays are emitting, but this is the CNO cycle. So these are the processes through which the elements on Earth uh, are being generated. So whatever we see, oxygen or carbon, they are all come from this nucleosynthesis processes. And this process actually keeps on continuing. So whenever you see a star, then in, inside the star, you have an iron core. Okay? And on the outside, it's like the hydrogen. So you can think of kind of the onion kind of shell. So the hydrogen burning will be finished, then the helium burning will finish, and then carbon, oxygen, and so on and so forth. And it will come into the iron core, and this process will be finishing. So basically what is happening, that two hydrogen are getting fused and then it creates the helium. And in the similar way, it will be fused with the other elements and it will create the iron. So this fusing process, this uh, nuclear fusion will stop when you go towards the iron core. And why it will stop again? So again, the same analogy, the Coulomb repulsion or the Coulomb barrier is so much large that uh, due, to, I mean, in order to having the fission, one need to overcome that Coulomb barrier, but that is not possible uh, like when you are reaching towards the iron core. And I am talking about the stellar environment or in the stars. So now you can ask questions. Okay, so this is the thing, but how come we have tin on Earth or uranium on Earth how come those elements are being produced? You can ask the questions. Those are being produced by different processes. They are called the S process, R process, etc. So again, in this nuclear chart, so this uh, stellar burning or this nucleosynthesis process will be continuing until the iron or let's say around the nickel region, let's say which has the atomic number 28, but beyond iron or nickel, the stellar burning process is not occurring. And what is occurring then, these are the different processes. Eventually they are the stable element. They are, they are created by the S process. It means that like the slow neutron capture process and it captures some neutrons and then it beta decays into the stable element, then captures another neutron, then beta decay in this way it goes. And there are some other process called the rapid, new, uh, uh, like the rapid neutron capture process or the R process here. And it goes very fast in this way. And also we have like the RP process, which is the rapid proton capture process, as you can see. And so, and then there is also the P process. It's simply the proton capture. And when, and, uh, and in this astronomical sites or in the astro uh, astrophysical objects where these are op uh, occurring, so these processes are occurring in case of the supernova or in case of the X-ray burst, etc. So uh, all these things are going over there and due to these processes, we have the elements that we see on the earth, let's say tin or uranium or lead, something like that. So in this context, the nuclear chart is very important to understand which part is being created, how. Okay, so now let us move into the, another topic. It's called the halo nucleus, as I said. So let's say we have the, like, uh, let's say we have the six lithium and we keep on increasing the neutron number. So it becomes seven lithium, then again, another neutron, eight lithium and so on and so forth. And then the 10 lithium doesn't exist, but then we have the 11 lithium in which you can see that 
the two neutrons are quite decoupled from the core over there. So this core is basically the nine lithium, and then we have two extra neutrons. Now, you have studied in your nuclear physics course that the radius of the nucleus goes roughly a to the power one third, okay? But for the halo nucleus, this is not anymore true because as you can see for the comparison that this is the lead nucleus and this is the calcium nucleus and this is the lithium and you can see that all the like the matter radius or the or the like this radius of this nucleus of 11 lithium is more or less comparable with lead or 48 calcium so you cannot apply this uh, formula for this 11 lithium and uh, till now, there are a lot of halo nucleus are present. And uh, yeah, so these are some of the examples. And I will show you the example of 29 fluorine over there. Okay, so what is happening that, so if you keep on measuring the radius of these isotopes of lithium, let's say six lithium, seven, eight, nine, etc. If you keep on measuring the radius, then suddenly the, in case of the 11 lithium, the radius changes drastically. So as you can also see from this, uh, from this picture, that these are, the, uh, these are the radius for six, seven, eight, nine lithium. And from nine lithium, there is a drastic change in this matter radius, okay? So, uh, so whenever a nucleus is a halo or not, you have to measure the radius of the previous isotope, in this case, the nine lithium, and then you can compare that whether 11 lithium is a halo or not. And also, again, as I said that uh, in, the, uh, in the very beginning, that if you measure the density distribution, and this density distribution is quite extended, as you can see, this is the uh, neutron density distribution, and uh, this is very much extended. So this is the wave function you can think of that. So now what is happening that, uh, so let's say, so let's say you have only one halo nucleus. So let's say instead of two, you have only one, okay? So for the time being, just imagine that. So let's say you have one halo nucleon, and then what the, so what you do, so you just shoot, so let's say this is your halo nucleon, and then you shoot it on some target. So let's say you have a carbon target, and then this carbon target will actually knock out this halo nucleon, and then this, uh, uh, then the rest of the nucleus will fly in one direction and the halo nucleon will fly into the another direction, okay? So it is just simply you knocking out that halo nucleon by due to this nuclear reaction. Now, in the center of mass frame, if you measure the momentum of this nucleus after being uh, knocked out, after this uh, halo nucleus is being knocked out, so if you measure the momentum of the nucleus uh, in the center of mass frame, that is equal and opposite to the momentum of the knocked out nuclear, right? So in the center of mass frame. So by measuring the momentum of the, uh, of the nucleus after the reaction, after, the, after this halo nucleus is knocked out, you can see what is the momentum of this halo nucleon and uh, then people have uh, like plotted the momentum distribution and you can see that the momentum distribution is quite narrow. Okay, so this is a very important thing. So the momentum distribution is quite narrow. And as you can see that if this nucleon, if this nucleon is actually removed from the S shell, then uh, this is the, this is the uh, distribution as you can see that it is very narrow, and if it is knocked out from the P shell, then it is also very narrow over there. So this you have to keep in mind. And if you uh, knock out a nucleon from a D shell, then of course you have a broader full width half maximum. So in the Y axis here, we are plotting the full width half maximum of this picture. And if it is knocked out from the D shell, then it has a broader full width half maximum. Okay, so this thing you just keep in mind. 
that when you knock out from the S shell or the P shell, then the full width half maximum is very low. And if you knock out from the D shell, then the full width half maximum is very large and the momentum distribution will be large. So why it is so? So let us uh, give you one example that these are the, uh, these are the oxygen isotopes, okay? And people have done this one nucleon removal or one valence nucleon removal over there. And as you can see, if you just concentrate on this line, then you can see that for 23 oxygen, the momentum distribution is very narrow as compared to the other isotopes. It means that uh, probably the nucleon or the valence nucleon is sitting in the S or the P orbital. And when we have the uh, like very narrow momentum, it means that it should have a large matter radius as compared to the previous one, or it says that 23 uh, oxygen is a halo nucleus. And again, here, if this is your uh, like the S or P orbital, so the momentum distribution will look like this. And if it is knocked out from the D or F orbital, the momentum distribution will look like this. Now, a question to you. You have all done this hydrogen atom in the quantum mechanics. So what is this, uh, what is this uh, uh, the term called the centrifugal barrier? Can anyone tell what is the expression of it? Anyone? Okay, L, L plus one, H cut is converted to M. Exactly, L, L. very good. Yes, so this L, L into L plus one by R square, something like that. So now imagine that if you are uh, knocking out the nucleon from the S orbital, it means that the central, uh, like the centrifugal barrier is zero. It means that the wave function can extend largely or in other words, it would be a halo nucleus. The same is true also for the P, uh, P shell because the amount of the centrifugal barrier will be, will be less. So then the wave function can extend largely, but if it is knocked out from the D or the F orbital, then uh, the wave function cannot extend largely because there is a huge centrifugal barrier. Okay, it is clear? Okay, uh, so then uh, what happens that if you have either one halo nucleon or two halo nucleon, so this halo nucleus will be sitting probably in the S orbital or the P orbital. And what are the S and P orbital? Those are the shell models that we just simply think of, okay? Yeah, so these are the S and the P orbital you have probably seen when you are studying the like the shell model in atomic nucleus. And this, uh, I mean, this uh, scientist, Maria Mayer, who has uh, like discovered this uh, technique. And, and of course, uh, like we have, uh, like uh, the, we can include the spin orbit coupling to understand also to understand like the different magic numbers and these are the orbitals I am talking about. Okay, so when it is knocked out from the S or the P orbital, there is a fairly chance that you have uh, it is basically a halo nucleon or the valence nucleon when it is sitting in this orbital, it could be a halo nucleus. But not always, I am saying, but yeah, sometimes. Okay. So if this is clear, then let us move to another part of the nuclear chart. So again, this is the proton number in the Y axis and the neutron number in the X axis. And this chart, this part of this nuclear chart, it's called the island of inversion. And why it is called island of inversion? Because if you just look into the normal shell model, so you have S shell, P shell, then D five by two, S one, uh, one by two, D three by two, et cetera. And after that you have one F seven by two, and then you have two P three by two. But particularly in this region, what is happening that this naive shell model is not following. So this 
p orbital is coming downwards so there is kind of the inversion of the shell so this p orbital is coming downwards and then the nucleons are being filled in this p shell instead of the f shell for example or b shell so this p uh, p orbital is being pushed the onwards and as i said that when it is pushed downwards like when the valence nucleons are like occupying the p orbital then it can have the halo nucleus and we have discovered that in 29 fluorine uh, it is a it is a halo nucleus because in case of the 29 fluorine the valence neutrons are sitting in this 2p 3 by 2 shells so for that what we did we measured the matter radius of 27 fluorine and we measured the matter radius of 29 fluorine and we have seen that there is a huge jump and this uh, proves the theory that this 29 fluorine is basically a halo nucleus and there is a very interesting point to know here that you probably all know that this 20 uh, is the magic number and when this p orbital is coming downwards then 20 is not anymore a magic number or in this particular region there is no magic number called 20 because this p shell because of this rearrangement of this shell and why there is rearrangement i am coming in a minute okay so this we have discovered and uh, this particular structure is called the boromian nucleus why boromian nucleus this is coming from one island probably in italy that if you have a core nucleus and these two extra neutrons and if you remove one of them then the rest of them becomes unstable or in the other words if you break one ring the other two rings are unstable so therefore this structure is particularly called the boromian nucleus so we uh, we published this paper uh, like the last year and this was also uh, like the big news in this japanese nuclear physics community so do not ask me to read this japanese letter but somehow it is being described that this 29 fluorine has been discovered and it is the heaviest boromian nucleus discovered till now okay so now the question is why there is a shell inversion or why the shells are being rearranged so this is due to the tensor interaction so we have the spin orbit interaction but apart from that we have a tensor interaction so for example this particular if you count the number of protons and number of the neutrons here this shows the nitrogen uh, like the nitrogen uh, 21 for example but if you like uh, go if you just put here another proton then what happens then then this force between the neutrons and protons will be even stronger then this shell will be pushed downwards and you can see there is a shell gap but if you remove all this proton so then this uh, like interaction is becoming weaker and then therefore this shell is being pushed upwards it means that the shell gap is no longer valid so we have also found that uh, uh, due to this interaction there is also a n equals to 14 shell gap which is occurring for nitrogen 21 so uh, similarly the, here are some magic number it is disappears like n equals to 8 magic number disappears in 11 lithium on the other hand in case of 22 carbon some new magic number appears at number 6 or if you consider 24 oxygen there is another magic number called 60. so if you keep on going if you increase the number of neutrons or if you go towards very exotic side of this uh, of this nuclear chart you will find some really interesting features over there okay so now i come to different topic it's called the giant resonances so what are the giant resonances so you can see that these are the, the uh, like the neutrons and protons so the red ones are the neutrons and the blue ones sorry red ones are the protons and the blue one are the neutrons and in this case they are like oscillating in phase you can see 
you can see that they are oscillating in phase and here they are oscillating out of phase here. Okay, and we have different multipolarities called monopole, dipole, quadrupole, etc. And this is occurring due to the collective excitations. So what is collective excitations? So you have one nucleus, uh, was, uh, yeah, sorry, you have one nucleon, you can excite this nucleon by a single excitation. But imagine you collectively excite all the nucleons together, okay? So, uh, so when you do that, then this giant resonance phenomena occurs. So among these giant resonances, these two modes are called the compression modes. Why it is called compression modes? Because if you look into their excitation energies, this excitation energies is directly related to the nuclear incompressibility, okay? So this Ka is the nuclear incompressibility. Uh, and what is Ka? I am showing you here that uh, this Ka means like how much you can compress a nucleus. Okay. So this is very important thing uh, in case of when you study the, like the stars and etc. And why it is important? So imagine that uh, what actually holds the, uh, like the, a star. So for example, there is some hydrogen burning, as I said, there is hydrogen burning. And, and then due to that hydrogen burning, you are creating some energy. And this energy is, uh, is actually balancing the gravitational collapse, okay? But imagine that uh, you are exhausted with all the fuels you have. You have burned uh, everything. Then this huge amount of the gravitational collapse will occur, okay? So huge uh, and all due to this, this uh, like the huge gravitational collapse, then what happens that at certain points, uh, it got exploded. So by looking into the giant resonances or the compression modes, you can see that how much you can compress. So for example, if you have a neutron star, so this neutron star, you can compress the neutron stars towards the neutron degeneracy. And what is that? So you all know about this Pauli's principle that no two fermions are, can occupy the same quantum state with the, uh, yeah, with the same amount of the, uh, like the quantum variable over there. So this is the neutron degeneracy and this is actually balancing the gravitational collapse uh, in case of the neutron star. And we want to study that how much one can compress the nucleus uh, uh, I mean, whatever it is, the neutron star or the supernova explosion. So this you can do. So for example, if you uh, have a spherical nucleus, okay, so if you have a spherical nucleus, then you will have, uh, like, if you see the excitation energy, then this excitation energy will look like this, okay? Uh, so these are uh, in case of the teen isotopes, and these are in case of the zirconium isotopes. And, but if you look into the deformed nucleus, then what happens that the deformed nucleus looks like this. And when you look into the giant resonances, you can see that it is being splitted, okay? So these plots are basically the isovector plot. What does that mean that the neutrons and protons are oscillating out of phase? And I am interested in the isoscalar part so we studied this uh, neodymium isotopes uh, with the isoscalar part. So the thing is that what is isoscalar? Isoscalar means like the delta T is equals to zero, okay? So the, like the change in, uh, so what is delta T? Delta T is basically the isospin is equals to zero. So you can excite a nucleus by, by, by actually shooting it with alpha, then only the isoscalar part will be excited. So you have some nucleus and you just shoot it with alpha and then it will be excited, the isoscalar part. But nevertheless, you can also do it with a deuteron. The deuteron also have the isospin equals to zero. So then we have the uh, like, uh, the, here are some pros and cons, whether you will use the alpha particle or deuteron, because in some cases the deuteron breaks and it creates some uh, unwanted backgrounds. And also the cross section with the alpha particle is higher than the, uh, with the deuteron over there. 
Okay, so we went to Osaka, Japan to do this experiment over there and we got some real nice spectrum. So uh, we are still analyzing. So these gentlemen are analyzing that one. So Debra Jyoti and Shower were the master student and Mohammed is the PhD student who is like uh, analyzing all the part over there. Okay. So now uh, quite, uh, uh, I mean, another interesting thing is that, so whenever you do the nuclear physics, you have to shoot a beam on the step, uh, on, a, on a target. So if your target is a stable target, then you can use this one as a target, right? So in this case, 58 nickel is a target and you can shoot it with alpha beam. And then you can look into the kinematics. So here I am plotting the laboratory energy versus the laboratory angle. And then in this case, this is the kinematics over there. But if you want to study the unstable nucleus, so you cannot use them as a target, right? Because it will simply decay. It will simply disintegrate. So what you have to do, then you have to use the alpha as the gaseous probe, and then you can shoot it with uh, like the unstable heavy projectile, for example, in this case. And this is called the inverse kinematics. And the kinematics actually changes when you do the, when this uh, is your, heavy projectile over there. Okay, so then what happens that uh, this is another example that this is the process of the inverse kinematics in this chamber. You are putting uh, all the like uh, all the alpha gas and then you are shooting with an unstable beam and here the reactions occurs and then you can study those reactions over there. So this is called the inverse kinematics or you can do another thing. So this is a ring. So this ring actually, you can make it circulate, uh, this unstable nucleus, you can make it circulate. And here you can put your target and then there will be some interactions and you can put your detector here and you can do some nice measurements up there. Okay, so I skip this one because the time is running out. Uh, so then, these are different tools that uh, I like with which you can actually study all these nice, uh, interesting features. And my specialty are given by these red uh, columns. And I am also doing a little bit of the gamma spectroscopy. So the question is how do you uh, create an exotic or unstable nuclei? So if you look into the map of the whole map, then there is like a lot of facilities that can create the unstable nucleus, but I am only uh, focusing on this GSI uh, facility, which is situated in Darmstadt in Germany. So I will only uh, focus on this part actually. So uh, then uh, how do you create uh, like some exotic nucleus. So what you can do, you can uh, put some target, let's say beryllium target, something like that. And then you have a stable nucleus that is coming at very high energy. And then uh, what happens that due to the reaction, a lot of violent processes are occurring and then some part of the nucleus can break, okay? And by this process, you can create some uh, like the exotic nucleus. And of course, you have to uh, guide them properly so that it reach to your experimental setup. And these are the other different processes. For example, by fission, you can also create some exotic nucleus or by the fusion, you can also create some exotic nucleus over there. And again, these are the nuclear chart and this uh, part like and then it shows that the different parts uh, like uh, being created uh, by which processes so the yellow part is being created by this projectile fragmentation as i said and this red part is being created by the fusion evaporation and this green part can be created by the fission process so by these different techniques you can access different uh, region of the nuclear chart Okay, so this is the facility uh, that is situated in, uh, in Darmstadt, Germany. So this is the existing facility. 
So what happens that you create an, uh, so you have an ion source. So from there you create an element and you are accelerating using a linear accelerator over here with a towards a speed of 20% speed of light. And it will inject on the synchrotron and it will be eventually uh, reached to almost the 90% speed of light. And these are the different experimental setup at which you can uh, like put your beam and then you can do some really cool stuff. So just a few uh, examples that imagine that if you have a prism and then if your light comes and this, uh, this prism and then the white light is actually uh, split into different parts depending on the wavelength. And if you look into the wavelength, then uh, this, in this direction, the wavelength increasing means the momentum is decreasing. So, uh, and in the similar way, if you have a dipole magnet, by this dipole magnet, you can guide different momentums over there. So this is a very important uh, feature. And then by this way, you can like look into the different species and different momentum of particles over there. So again, this is another example that this momentum, the, uh, this, uh, this basically your centrifugal force, and then this is this uh, uh, QVB is the, uh, Due, uh, due to this magnet, like uh, here, it is the dipole magnet, and you can actually rearrange those, and this is called the magnetic rigidity over there. And by looking into the different magnetic rigidity means like you will have the different momentum of the particle. And by this technique, you can actually separate out different high energy or low, low energy particle in this way. So yeah, so let's see. Uh, Again, this is the GSI facility over there. And uh, here, uh, so these are the dipole magnets and these are some quadruple magnets for the focusing. And these are the different experimental setup we have. And uh, then what happens then we have seen this equation. Okay, and uh, these are called the music detector where you can uh, like look into the atomic energy uh, I mean, you can identify the atomic energy using these music detectors. You have the scintillators uh, in different places, and the scintillator will uh, just count what is the like the time of flight from one place to the another place. And these TPCs means like they are like the time projection chamber, some ionization chamber. They are actually calculating what is the beam position as the beam passes through. So combining all this, uh, like all this uh, information, one can actually look, uh, uh, one can identify the different uh, nucleus. So here you are plotting the atomic number and here you are plotting the mass over charge. And by doing that, one can identify different nucleus. But uh, in order to get this picture, then there are a lot of things are, uh, one need to do. And this uh, gentleman is uh, doing that thing, this uh, like all the hard working that is behind this picture, he is doing uh, this. So all of you know him, Suraj. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I am almost close to the end. So these are some snapshot of different accelerator facilities. So this is basically the linear accelerator that is in GSI in the Darmstadt. This is the synchrotron. So you are not allowed to go here due to huge radiation. So, but nevertheless, uh, people have taken some pictures, some technicians. So this is the synchrotron. And this is the like some other magnets and the quadrupole and the dipole through which the beam passes towards the experimental area. So uh, then the, uh, this is the existing GSI facility. And this facility is increasing in size and it, it will be called uh, like the FAIR facility or facility for antiproton and ion research. So this is basically one synchrotron, but then there is another huge synchrotron over there. It will accelerate even more and then it can actually pass the beam towards different experimental areas as you can see. So India is also the part of this uh, FAIR program and it consists of 3.5% share of this fair share, like the total share over there. So uh, if you fly over GSI uh, and the, uh, I mean, 
the Frankfurt airport is very close to GSI. So if you have the chance to visit this Frankfurt airport, and if you, uh, if you are lucky, then you can fly over this place and you can see that there is a huge tunnel has been dug up to, uh, to accommodate the big synchrotron and the small synchrotron is somewhere here over there and it will, it will just pass the beam from the small synchrotron to the large synchrotron. And this synchrotron is so big that if you look into the Google map, then you can also see the, like the synchrotron size over there. And just check into the Google, you will see that this is the, this is the synchrotron over there. And they are doing some the very nice things over there. And probably the fear facility will come up in the, the whole, uh, I mean, the whole, uh, like the facility is being built up. And the whole facility will come up in the year of 2025 or 26, something like that. So in case of the PR facility, we have different, uh, like the processor, like the different pillars. So we have the new star, APA, APA for the atomic physics, and then we have CVM, we have Panda, and then these are the different pillars, but I am only involved in this new star, which is uh, like the nuclear structure and astrophysics. Okay, so I think that's all, and uh, this is my collaboration. And before finishing, I want to show you uh, one nice, uh, like the video, uh, if you are still awake. So this is the like the fair construction site. So this is the drone footage of the site as being built. So this is the existing GSI facility over here. Uh, yeah, so this is the synchrotron, this is the huge synchrotron that is being built over here, as you can see. Yeah, some moon. Uh, so this will be all the experimental areas and here this uh, will be again the synchrotron over there. And this is the inside the synchrotron, so you cannot see it. Eventually, if you visit GSI, you cannot enter into this tunnel whenever they are running the experiment because there will be huge amount of the radiation will be there. And in order to protect the radiation, there is a huge concrete block are, are showing. Uh, so just I can make it fast forward, yeah. So a lot of activities are still going on over there. Yeah. So I think that's all. And, uh, and as I said, like the future is always, uh, like the future is always promising. And with this, I am ready to take questions. Uh, sir, we have a question uh, in the comment section. Mm -hmm. Harshini has asked, what is the reason behind hello nuclei? Ah, okay. So, again, okay. yeah. So the reason is that when you are increasing the number of neutrons, then as I said, that there are some uh, like complicated interactions are also going on. It is apart from these strong interactions, there are also the tensor interactions and due to that tensor interactions you have the uh, so you have this shell model that you have studied but then due to this complicated tensor interactions some of these shells are coming up and down or some shells are pushing up so if you have a valence nucleon which is occupying in the s shell or the p shell then as i said that the centrifugal barrier for that valence nucleon will be quite less, and then the wave function can, ex can extend largely, and due to that, you have a very large matter radius, or in other words, like these nucleus are kind of the decoupled from that in order to have a large matter radius. So this is due to the like different arrangement of the shells that is occurring. Okay, Harshini, I hope that has answered your question. Another question, Ram Kumar is asking, can GMR be thought as Mozarbier effect in the larger scale? Mm, that I don't know. I cannot answer this one at this moment. I do not think so. I do not think so. It, 
can be. So it is basically the collective excitations of all the nucleons. And you can consider this one in terms of the laser action, for example, or the lasing action. So it is the co coherent excitation of all the nucleons. And due to this factor, we have the giant resonances. OK, Suraj is asking, why are we more interested in exotic nuclei with much more neutron than proton, but not in nuclei with more proton than neutron? Yeah, this is a very good question. So uh, for example, uh, why we are, uh, so whatever features that we discussed here, that can be also visible in the proton, but you cannot, in, or like in other words, like it is not a proton rich nucleus, but you can consider it as a neutron deficient nucleus. So whenever you are increasing the proton number, you are changing the element, okay? So uh, let me go here, for example. So you cannot uh, change the proton number because if you change the proton number, you are changing the element. So what you can do, you can remove the neutron, okay? So basically this part is called the proton rich or neutron deficient. So now the thing is that you can see the extension on the both side. You have more neutron side region on the right hand side, but very less amount of the nucleus on the left hand side. And why it is that this is due to simply the Coulomb repulsion because the thing is that eventually if you keep on removing the neutrons, then at certain point, the Coulomb repulsion is so huge that it will not be form any nucleus. So it will be readily disintegrate. So you cannot study anything. So the amount of the amount of like exotic structures that is limited on the proton or the neutron deficient side rather than the neutron rich side over there. Does it answer my question, your question? Suraj, is it fine? Yeah, he's fine with this. Shreyan is asking, how do we know that nuclei exhibit resonance? Yeah, so this is a very good question. So the nuclear exhibit resonance means like, for example, you can have the, no, you can have the, just one second, I go to that picture. So you can have a single resonance. You can have a single resonance means like if you go to, uh, like if you plot the excitation energy, you can have a single resonance means like you are exciting uh, one single particle, okay? But whenever you are, exciting a collectively a nucleus, then you should, uh, so when you plot the excitation energy, it will be this big. And why it is this big? Because then there are a lot of complicated interactions that are going on. For example, one particle, one hole, two particle, two hole, so, such kind of uh, coupling are occurring. So due to that, it can have a broad width. So therefore it's called the giant. But nevertheless, when you are exciting a single particle, then you will, uh, will have a, like a narrow peak and that will tell you that the resonance is occurring. Okay, I hope Shreyan that is fine. If not, you can obviously ask another. Suraj is asking another question. You told about SIS 100 and SIS 300. What is yes. the meaning of 100 and 300 here? Yes, this is another very good question. So let me go to the picture, then it will be Yeah, so this, uh, this SIS, uh, uh, so this is SIS 18 and this is SIS 100. So what does that mean? 18 means that the maximum energy that you can accelerate it with 18 Tesla meter. So what is 18 Tesla meter? So just here I go on here. So this is your magnetic rigidity, right? So if you just use this equation, so this magnetic rigidity is basically uh, will be 18 Tesla meter. So whatever, and then you can have different elements and then you can just do some simple mathematics and then you can convert that uh, magnetic rigidity into energy. And SIS 100 means like the maximum rigidity is 100 Tesla meter. And then you will have, if you just convert that into energy, it means that you will have more energy. So here the maximum energy, roughly an order of uh, like the estimate. So for example, if you use, let's say lead, and if you use this 18 Tesla meter, uh, like the synchrotron, then the maximum energy of the lead could be one GeV per nucleon 
or in other words, 208 GeV, because you have to multiply it with the nuclear number. But when you are going here, the maximum energy could be like 3, 4 GeV, for example, because simply the magnetic rigidity is higher. Okay, I hope Suraj that is fine. If not, you can again ask. Ram Kumar, there's another question from him. Do GMR monopoles have any connection with magnetic monopoles like Dirac or Polyakov hoofed monopoles? Uh, no, no, no. It is it is simply due to this, uh, uh, like this, uh, like how to say? It's uh, it's basically the uh, like the compression modes and all the nucleon and all these protons and neutrons are like oscillating in phase and it, it has nothing to do with this magnetic monopole no, uh, that it was. Yeah, so, so yeah, it has nothing to do with this magnetic one. But of course, like uh, then uh, I only show you uh, the very simplistic connections, like for example, when you have like the delta T is equals to zero, it means that they are isoscalar, but in this case, I am assuming the spin flip, the spin flip is also zero, but then you can also consider the non-spin flip and etc. So then uh, some more different terms of the di uh, like the giant resonance will come up. So you can consider the spin change and uh, as well as the isospin change in this case, but not, it has nothing to do with the magnet. Okay, so I think we are at the end of the questions. There's no more questions. So if anyone has any other doubts, please feel free to ask. You can also email me if you have any questions later on, and then I would be happy to answer. Yeah, sure, you can email him. Fine, I don't think there's any more doubt for the session. So that's it. And uh, that was indeed a very informative talk. I, on behalf of Physics Club, thank you, sir, for being a part of this Sarabhai online lecture series and giving us such a beautiful presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And I would also like to thank our faculty advisor, Dr. Kamlesh Pathak, the head of Department of Physics. SVNIT, Dr. Divisha, and all the other faculties of the department without whose support this wouldn't have been possible. And last but not the least, I thank my fellow batchmate Suraj Kumar Singh for contacting Dr. Bakshi in the very first, first place, due to which we came to know about him. Uh, and uh, of course, you have been a wonderful